Hey, it's Nathan. And so in the last video in this series, we talked about induction and a lot of induction arguments are centered around the idea of proving a for all statement, at least when that for all statement is regarding natural numbers. Um, but I wanted to spend some just a little bit of time talking about existence proofs because there are usually different strategies to approach uh, existence arguments as well. And I want to go through two examples, one which illustrates a, a I guess, a sticking point between uh, proof based mathematics and computation based mathematics that uh, I think a lot of people kind of relate to when they hear that you have to show your work. Uh, and then the second one is like an important thing about primes, which shows like a nice uh, argument of contradiction and how you can work with existence and do this sort of like break math thing. So generally speaking, there are two methods of proof when it comes to working with existence arguments. So there is the most natural thing that you could do, which is to go ahead and construct the thing that the claim reports to exist. So the claim says this thing exists. The proof is just I am going to construct it. Now that proof may not be constructive, uh, but it will give you some like process that is deliberate in showing that, oh, you can make a thing that has this property using other things that we know. And then the second way to go about existence proofs is just to say, well, if you don't have this thing in math, it breaks math. Uh, so in order to illustrate this, I want to go through two examples. So the first one is just, let's do some simultaneous linear equations, right? So proposition is that there is an X and a Y within the real numbers such that the equations X plus Y is equal to three and X minus Y is equal to seven hold simultaneously. So the proof here is very quick because you can just say, let x equal 5 and y equal negative 2. Then 5 plus negative 2 is 3 and 5 minus negative 2 is 7. Hence, the equations hold simultaneously for these x and y values. And that may feel really not satisfying to a lot of people because uh, we sort of like drone in when you're learning how to do computations that you have to show all of your work and you have to be uh, clear in the work that you show and blah, blah, blah. Uh, and a lot of people kind of, I think a lot of people who are like quick with math struggle with this at some point. Uh, and even those that don't uh, sort of that, I guess if you didn't want to use, uh, do your work and you wanted to just use a calculator, you might also struggle with this as well, where the thought process is just like, well, I found the answer, so it should be fine, right? And so it's just a difference in the communication styles between proof writing and uh, computation. So in computation, usually you want to justify everything to clearly explain how you got to the, the answer to support your answer, because um, it's just like, you want to demonstrate that the things that you're doing at each step of the computation are valid. Whereas in proof writing, usually we just want to know something is true or not. And the clearer your argument is, the easier it is to read. So if you can just give the things that work, then that's proof enough. This happens a lot in real analysis. And it's like a very really big sticking point of real analysis where, especially when you're doing epsilon and delta arguments, a lot of times uh, the proofs just start with take delta equal to this thing and, that th and you show that that thing works. But in the background, you're doing some background work. Like in this problem, in the background, uh, it's kind of like an algebra exercise, but in the background, you did some algebra to get X is equal to five and Y is equal to negative two. The same thing happens uh, in other areas of math and how proofs are presented in other areas of math. So it's an important thing to keep in mind when you're reading proofs, even though an argument may not be clear in where they got the solution, as long as the argument and the solution that they report 
clearly shows that the property that they're trying to say is true holds, then that's a fine proof. And, it, and usually we try to go for the most concise proofs that we can. So um, a lot of times there are uh, scratch work details that are left out that you would have had to show in a computation style class. So that's my little rant on some of the differences between proof-based math and computation. Um, but uh, I wanted to go also through another or the second version of existence proof because this is an important thing about primes and it's a nice thing to see if you haven't seen it before because uh, it gives you a, a way of like thinking about uh, existence as the lack of something breaking something. The proposition here is that there are infinitely many primes uh, and so this is an existence statement but it's an existence statement about there being a large number of things and it's hard to construct a large number of things especially primes because primes we know have uh, these weird structures uh, in them and they're all of these like very cool visuals that you can look at and you can get really really big numbers that are prime uh, and some of them are like next to each other like twin primes and some of them are very far apart so how do you prove that there are infinitely many of them without doing some weird calculation well you just go ahead and suppose that there are finitely many of them now if you go ahead and suppose that there are finitely many of them we can go ahead and define this new number big m which we're going to say big m is going to be the product of all of the primes right up to the maximum of the set of primes which is going to be the largest prime because we suppose that the set of primes is finite and then so we're going to take that huge product and then we're going to add one the cool thing about this is that when you add one um, if you were to go ahead and try to divide by any of the primes in your finite set of primes none of those primes would divide that new number big m However, from a previous video, we know that big M must have some prime factorization. We don't know if it's unique or not, because I didn't prove that, uh, but we showed that there is one. And so, well, there is one, but none of the finitely many primes that you say exist could be in that prime factorization. There's a problem here, because that would say that M does not have a prime factorization. So, therefore, this construction of this new natural number m breaks math and we get a contradiction uh, so there must be infinitely many primes so that's basically all i wanted to get through in terms of my little like musings on existence proofs the exercises for this video are slightly different in flavor they are existence arguments uh in some sense or they're proof disproof arguments um but they revolve around this idea of self-descriptive numbers. You can find a lot about self-descriptive numbers out on the internet, and answers to these questions are all readily Googleable. Um, and there are many videos on YouTube about the first one um, as well. Uh, so um, if you want to try these, you probably have already you and you spend a lot of time on the math side of YouTube, you may have already seen a solution for these. But they're good things to try to write down in full detail because they force you to think about case analysis and existence arguments and how to structure something from a writing perspective. Um, so the first question is just show that there is a unique self-descriptive number in base 10, which means that the table with uh, a row of 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and it being filled in by A0, A1, A2, A3, all the way up to A9, uh, reports the number of corresponding digits in the number. So A0 will tell you how many zeros are in the number, and A1 will tell me how many ones are in the number, and A2 will tell you how many twos are in the number, and A3 will tell you how many threes are in the number, and so forth, all the way up to A9, which will tell you how many nines are in the number. So there is that problem, right? So that's the one where there's like a famous number file video out there about it, that they talk through how you can think about proving this and all of this stuff. So that, but if you were to sit down and write it out yourself, um, it's definitely something that if you're trying to get better at proof writing, it's something you should do at least once in your life because it really sort of like gets at how you should structure things from a writing point of view. Um, the second one is, I don't think I've seen people talk about, but um, it's 
not super crazy. It just sounds kind of crazy out the outset. Uh, so it's just that a prove or disprove that there is a self-descriptive number for any given base n where n is greater than or equal to 2. And then the last problem here is to go ahead and prove or disprove that there is an n within the naturals such that in base n a self-descriptive number is not unique. So that's all I have for this video. If you want more of this intro math structures slash intro proof writing stuff, um, I'm still working on this series and the playlist is up here of what's been done so far. Um, and then I also do other math things on here other than the series. I talk about me as a human and all that stuff. So you can go find it where it is. Uh, but anyway, as always, I am Nathan. This one was Chalk and I will see you next time.